dead body here. When a controversial doctor is found dead. Do I have a murder? Do I have a suicide? There's no way. That's not my dad. This case is one of the most suspicious I've ever dealt with. Conspiracy theories erupt. Assassinations happen. This is a government stuff behind the scenes. Black ops. A family digs for answers. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are we getting into here? Don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. Don't shoot me. Was Jeffrey Bradstreet at the end of his room? The final report says suicide. Correct. Or had his radical medical practice attracted the wrong kind of attention? He fought the establishment. You believe he was killed? I believe someone took him out. I'm Tony Harris. In my 30 years as an investigative reporter, I've learned that every crime reveals a world of trouble. A family, a neighborhood, an entire town changed forever. Come with me to the scene of the crime. This is beautiful Chimney Rock State Park in Western North Carolina. People come here from all over for the expansive beauty, small town tranquility, and the thrill of the occasional big catch. I'm here to find out how a mysterious event shattered this peaceful retreat and fueled suspicions of a dark conspiracy. On June 19th, 2015, a little after 4 p.m., a local fisherman makes a grizzly discovery. Can you can help you? Hello. We're uh, fishing out here on uh, the creek, and we found a dead body here. You're seeing the dead body? Yeah, they're just laying in the water here. The 911 call came in roughly 4.15 in the afternoon. Rutherford County's Lieutenant Jamie Kiever is on duty that afternoon. When you arrive here, the initial report is body in the water. So what work is going on in the water? They were just trying to get him onto some kind of backboard or get him to shore. And my sergeant called me and said, you need to come out here and look at this. I walked down to the shoreline where they had pulled him from the river and saw a gunshot wound to the left chest, uh, around, right around the heart. Had a gun been found? The gun had not been found. We immediately called for the Henderson County Rescue Squad and they responded and was able to find a gun not too far from the bottom. What's starting to take shape in your mind? Do I have a murder? Do I have a suicide? Do I have a robbery that's taking place? The body in the river, Lieutenant Kieber quickly learns, is an infamous doctor named Jeffrey Bradstreet. He is notorious for his unorthodox and personally inspired work with autistic patients. I am Dr. Jeff Bradstreet. I'm a medical doctor by training. If I didn't have a kid with autism, I wouldn't be standing up here, I guarantee you. No one understands Bradstreet's passionate journey into the world of autism more than his ex-wife and mother to his two children, Lori Bradstreet. Tell me where and when you met Jeff. Hospital cafeteria, Scott Air Force Base. He was in the medical corps. He impressed me. He impressed me as a hardworking person who genuinely cared about his patients. After leaving the military, Dr. Bradstreet dedicates all his energy to his own private practice. Until one day, his life is transformed. One of his patients was a pastor, and he challenged him to read the Bible. And boom, the Holy Spirit started to speak to him. Faith 
drives Dr. Bradstreet's work. He begins mixing ministry with medicine. But a family crisis soon consumes his entire focus. His son Matthew is diagnosed with autism. The Bradstreets are quickly convinced the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine is to blame. Tell me about Matthew. Matthew was born February 28th, 1994. But he seemed to grow and develop fine until the MMR. He got the first one about 15 months. And when he got the booster at age four, that night, Matthew screamed the entire night. And the next day, we realized we had lost him. I mean, he couldn't button buttons anymore. He couldn't zip a zipper. He couldn't tie his shoes. He had lost all bowel and bladder control. Oh, yeah, it's bad. Matthew is diagnosed with autism in 1998. The very same year, a British doctor named Andrew Wakefield sets off an international health scare, claiming he's found a link between autism and the MMR vaccine. My opinion is that the risk is related to the combined vaccine, the MMR. Like many desperate parents across the globe, the Bradstreets find one thread of hope in this news. If a cause supposedly has been found for autism, maybe a cure is next. And finding that cure quickly becomes Dr. Bradstreet's life mission. When the pediatrician told us this boy has autism and you probably better prepare to put him in an institution, we were indignant. We were not going to say that's okay. Jeff Bradstreet starts prescribing a host of experimental treatments that he claims helps curb his son's autism. I took hyperbaric oxygen, IV chelation, IVIG, um, lots of medications for inflammatory bowel disease, huge efforts at restoring his ecosystem, MRT, ultrasound, laser, all of those we've, we've done on my son, every bit of that. Desperate parents from around the globe find his potent mix of faith and medical training irresistible. He becomes a bit of a, of a rock star in this space, doesn't he? Yeah, he, he spoke to a lot of, um, at a lot of conferences, and he was highly sought after. His reputation as a medical messiah soars, even as his marriage of 20 years falls apart. It was hard on a marriage. It was really hard. I mean, there were times that I sort of had the impression he cared more about other people than he cared about us. He was always wealthy. Dr. Bradstreet and Lori divorce in 2009. He quickly meets and marries a younger woman named Jennifer, who also has an autistic son. She becomes his constant companion in life and work. I'm Dr. Jeff Bradstreet, and today I'm joined with my wife, Jennifer. And on the day Dr. Bradstreet's body is discovered, Jennifer is there, on the scene, within minutes of the 911 call. She tells Lieutenant Kiever that she and Dr. Bradstreet had planned to spend the weekend at the nearby Lake Lore Inn. When he failed to show, she set off looking for him. Around 2.45, Jennifer Bradstreet didn't see his vehicle at the Lake Lore Inn, so she drove up the main highway toward Henderson County and saw Dr. Bradstreet's car at the pull-off. The Overlook is a romantic spot the couple had visited before. When you talked to her, how would you describe her state of mind? She was upset. She was crying. She thought that was her husband that was in the river. And the conversation was, why do you think it's your husband? Why would he be here? Jennifer tells Lieutenant Kiever she was alarmed about her husband's state of mind, that he had been acting rash. He had paid off her car the day before. She also said that they were in the process of buying a new house and that he called and canceled the closing. Lieutenant Kiever also learns that Jennifer and Dr. Bradstreet had several phone conversations lasting late into the night. 
She said that he was acting paranoid. He would not talk to her very long on the phone, that he thought the federal government was listening in on him. Most people don't suspect the federal government is tapping their phones. So what was going on here? One of the things that Jennifer Bradstreet told me was that he made a comment, I guess I'm gonna have to be a martyr for the, for the cause. For the cause? Cause of autism. What would drive Dr. Bradstreet to make such an extreme statement? And what was behind his fear of the federal government? What was he up against? He fought the establishment. Tough fight. For two decades, Dr. Bradstreet's battle with conventional medicine centers on two things. His use of unauthorized treatments for autism and a public fight with the government over childhood vaccines. He even testified twice in front of Congress. To his supporters, the fact that he was so outspoken made him a target. Did he ever fear for his safety? He did. He did. He feared for his safety? Yeah, he knew he was stirring the pot. Jeff lived in fear that someone was going to get him. On the day Dr. Bradstreet is found dead, their daughter, E.B., receives a final message from her father that she suspects confirms his worst fear. What do you remember about the 19th? I went to work and I was like, oh, crap, you know, it's almost Father's Day. I better, you know, send him a card. So I was texting at 11, 12 a.m. He responds back, love you lowercase l which struck me as odd he always would capitalize his letters and he always wrote a complete sentence saying i love you evie so i wasn't sure it was him because that's not really how he texted me you are not completely convinced that he wrote that text that is true Maybe someone else had his phone and sent that. And maybe he was already gone at that point. While E.B. suspects foul play, Lieutenant Kiever and his team have come to their own initial conclusion about what happened. On June 23rd, Rutherford County Police release a public statement. The gunshot wound appears self-inflicted, suggesting suicide. What was the reaction you received to issuing the statement? A bunch of phone calls from people across the United States. Across the country? Across the country. Saying that there's no way that Dr. Bradstreet would have killed himself. As Dr. Bradstreet's family and his supporters react with outrage, money pours in for a private investigation into what they are certain is murder. On June 19, 2015, Dr. Jeffrey Bradstreet is found dead in a North Carolina river. He's known worldwide for his controversial efforts to cure autism, drawn to the cause by his own son's diagnosis. After a brief investigation, local police believe the manner of death is suicide. But Dr. Bradstreet's fervent supporters, including his brother and sister-in-law, cry foul play. Tom and Candace, I want to know what your reaction was to the news that the police were saying it looked like your brother committed suicide. No way. He would not. Way. It doesn't speak to anything that Jeff was. You didn't accept it then? You don't accept the idea now? Absolutely not. He was a man of faith, okay? You know, he wasn't ever in a spot where he was hopeless. 
you want to find out the truth. Absolutely. And it wasn't until we really took a look at the preliminary autopsy yeah. that we said, this just doesn't make sense. And that led the family to launch your own investigation? Correct. Within days of his brother's death, Tom starts an online fundraising campaign that brings in more than $42,000. Dr. Bradstreet's daughter, E.B., supports the idea of a private investigation. But she soon finds out that her stepmother, Jennifer, is completely against it. Did you have a conversation with Jennifer about the family wanting to continue and conduct its own investigation? I was on the phone with her. She told me that she had been informed that the Broad Street family was doing an investigation, and she was not happy about that. She wasn't happy. She was very unhappy. She started yelling. Yelling at you? Yelling at the idea. She was very convinced that it was suicide. And she was like, why doesn't anybody believe that, you know, this was suicide? Why do they have to do their investigation? The police are doing it. Despite Jennifer's objections, the Bradstreet family hires a team of private investigators, including forensic scientist Michael Archer. If you take a look at the medical examiner's report and what the detective has said about the case so far, it seems pretty straightforward. Tony, I don't think this case is straightforward at all. You don't? In my 18 years of doing this and hundreds of homicides and hundreds of unnatural deaths, this case is one of the most suspicious I've ever dealt with. There's nothing in this autopsy report that concludes this is a suicide. You have the autopsy report there? I do, yes. Where do you begin to take issue with some of the conclusions here? All right. You see blunt force injuries to his chest, his abdomen, his extremities. Blunt force injuries. Boom, boom. Something, right, comes in contact with you. It doesn't have to be a fist. It could be a branch. It could be a bat. It could be, it could be any number of things. It could be him att attempting to get away from a cat door. There's things that could explain these injuries that I don't think were ever seriously looked at. Do you have an explanation for the abrasions? Nobody has an explanation. That's what makes this case so suspicious. And if foul play was involved, the river was a perfect place to commit murder. A water death is one of the most complicated deaths to investigate for a number of reasons. Some evidence is washed away or hidden. And if you want to kill someone and you're a savvy killer, Doing it in the water is a good place to do it. To demonstrate what Michael thinks happened, he takes me to the exact spot where Dr. Bradstreet's body was discovered. As part of his investigation, Michael is granted access to sealed crime scene photos. Those coupled with the autopsy report lead him to the conclusion that Dr. Bradstreet may have been murdered. We're gonna get in that water and I'm gonna put the mannequin in position. I have our prop gun with us, and I'm gonna demonstrate the homicidal violence scenario. It's explained away just like this. Dr. Bradstreet's begging for his life. Don't shoot me, don't shoot me, don't shoot me. Boom. A round goes off. There's no signature that I saw Michael claims that had Dr. Bradstreet in fact shot himself, there would have been distinct markings around the gunshot wound, what he calls a signature on the skin. When the gun is fired and the bullet comes out, yes. pieces of hot metal get implanted in the skin and leave a mark, some stippling, some tattooing. It's never going to go away, and you don't see that. And you looked for that when you were taking a look at those, those photographs. It was the first thing I looked for. 
The lack of stippling around the wound suggests the gun could have been beyond Dr. Bradstreet's reach when it was fired. I wanted to try to determine muzzle to target, the target being Dr. Bradstreet's chest. And muzzle to target. Explain why that is significant and, and why that needed to be a part of the investigation. If this gun gets farther away, beyond the reach yes. of the person holding it, then we know that it's a homicide. According to Michael, had the police conducted what's known as a muzzle to target test, they would have known exactly how far away the gun was when it was fired. There's a very simple test they could have done, yeah. and they chose not to do it. They right. have not done that test. And any conclusion that suggests that this was case closed, a suicide, uh, is dubious at best. <laughs> it's premature. It's outrageous as far as it's I'm outrageous. concerned. It's outrageous. Absolutely. What I believe is that homicidal violence is a reasonable explanation here. Now, who did it? I don't know. But I can tell you that somebody could have done this to Dr. Bradstreet and shot him in the chest. If the police are wrong about the suicide, if Dr. Bradstreet was murdered, then the question stands, who would have wanted him dead? And did it have anything to do with his radical work? I'm going to introduce the Bradstreet Essence Protocol. We have an unusual practice, and I'm really proud of what we've accomplished. We have... After years of prescribing unusual treatments to his patients, Dr. Bradstreet hones in on what he believes is the ultimate miracle cure, called GC Math. Developed in the early 90s in Japan to treat cancer, Dr. Bradstreet is the first doctor in the United States to apply GC Math to autism. And GC Math has been one of the most powerful tools that I've ever used for autism. So how many of you were GC Math responders and thought it was amazing? When's the first time you heard of GC Math? And what is GC Math? It's a vitamin D binding protein. And then he thought that there was some huge promise in it. And I believe it even said that, you know, 60, 70, maybe even upwards to 80% of his patient base was was responding to it favorably. The average was about 12 to 14 weeks. We had an 85% response rate. 40% of them to basically lose the label of autism. They don't have autistic distinctions anymore. After sometimes as little as 20 weeks. Only five months to cure what has been labeled an incurable disorder? Like so much of Dr. Bradstreet's work, the medical mainstream rejects this claim because they say there is no verifiable proof. Was Jeff representing himself as someone who had the answer to autism, who had a cure for autism? I think that's an easy assumption to make, yes. That's powerful. Well, faith is powerful. The cure word is real in autism. There are some individuals that have already been cured. They don't have autism. They're not at risk for remission. They're on with their lives. They're in their 20s. They're doing great. They're home free. That exists. So the end of May, he's at Autism One saying, I'm close to, to a close. cure. We're close to a cure Correct. for autism. And literally, weeks later he's dead less than 30 days does that feel suspicious to you well i don't know how one can't think that he says we're close to a cure i mean you have to be blind not to think well do, does that have anything to do with what happened dr bradstreet's bold claims and experimental treatments for autism bring him great notoriety and just as he feared, the attention of the federal government.
In late May 2015, Dr. Jeffrey Bradstreet hints to his legions of followers that he's on the brink of finding a cure for autism. The cure word is real in autism. There are some individuals that have already been cured. They don't have autism. But just a few weeks after making these claims, Dr. Bradstreet's body is found floating in a North Carolina river. Did you see in the dead body? Yeah. Police suspect suicide. But many of his supporters, including his own family, believe he may have been murdered. And if you check out a variety of online and broadcast sources, he's not the only doctor whose sudden death raises suspicions. A prominent autism researcher and vaccine opponent was found dead under what many are calling suspicious circumstances. Bob Shell tonight, we go live to Bonita Springs, Florida. In last hours, mystery surrounding the murder of a gorgeous young doctor. Not the only Florida doctor with ties to holistic medicine found dead in recent weeks. There is an eighth doctor just announced it an hour or two ago. Why was the doctor murdered in Jupiter Park? I'm on my way to meet Robert Scott Bell, an alternative medicine expert who hosts the syndicated radio show called The Power to Heal. So where is it? There it is, into the studio. Oh, this is what? Right in your home? Yeah, we got it. You created a little space for yourself. Perfect place to, to reach the world. Hi. Hey. Hey, Erin. How are you doing? How are you doing? You Tonight's doing guest, Erin right? Elizabeth, yeah, has spent months huh? blogging about a series of sudden deaths, starting with Dr. Bradstreet and suggesting a conspiracy. I asked if I could listen in on the show. The Robert Scott Bell Show. Robert Scott Bell Show. Taking on bureaucrats and corporations, making sense out of medical propaganda. Robert Scott Bell. We've got a very special guest in studio here. You know what I think we should do is kind of set the stage for new listeners. Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, to make a long story short, back last year on June 19th, we had Dr. Bradstreet found dead in a river with a gunshot wound to his chest. But while I was writing that, I found out that a holistic doctor I knew here in Florida had also been found dead. And within a few hours, then another doctor, then another holistic doctor found dead at 33. If you took Dr. Bradstreet's death, the first death on his own, then that, that might be not that strange. But when you have so many, I, I saw a pattern emerge. What Aaron calls a pattern, others call coincidence. One person died in a car accident. Another fell trying to climb up his balcony, and another died of a heart attack. But if you're looking for a conspiracy, so many deaths are hard to ignore. There are billions of dollars at stake here. If anybody's read a Shakespeare play, it doesn't take billions to motivate somebody to do some horrible stuff. Oh, yeah. Right? Yes. Assassinations happen. And this is government stuff behind the scenes black ops as they call it so were you able to find any definitive link or is it still up in the air it's still unraveling well finally i've had a little time to try to, to do my best to investigate but the problem was that there were so many dying it's just hard for me to uh, imagine that all of those are coincidence i have personal interaction with two doctors that that you covered and i knew very well like dr bradstreet of yes. course you mentioned that to me is the most mysterious of all of them Jeff Bradstreet's research was a threat to what structures in modern medicine? The pharmaceutical structure, and that, that includes the manufacture and selling, selling of vaccines. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Now, he was also working with something called GCMAF. Yes. Right? And GCMAF is potentially what? A miracle what? As we've been hearing from these physicians that are working with it as a uh, cure for cancer, potentially, and a very significant reversal or reversing substance for autism. When you look at motive, follow the money, who's threatened by whatever Dr. Bradstreet or similar doctors are doing or revealing or about to reveal? So in your mind, the FDA is a 
potential suspect. We don't know the answer, but it, it needs to be found because if this GCMAF is what they're claiming it is, and if that was the cause of his death, obviously that's a huge story. What do you believe happened here? I believe someone took him out. You believe that? Yes, you do. Correct. Law enforcement says suicide, but you believe he was killed? I do. I, I, can't, I can't find a motivation for him to take himself out. While it may sound far-fetched that Dr. Bradstreet was killed for his work with GC Math, in the months leading up to his death, he is aware that the government is indeed circling in on his so-called miracle cure. And those closest to him are worried. Is it fair to say that he was treating patients with GC Math? Absolutely. This would eventually cause him a more serious problem. Is that fair to say? Yeah, no one knew at the time, but yes. You know, it was starting to come to the surface that this is not something that, that um, the FDA or the DEA is happy about. It turns out that in early 2015, the FDA started cracking down on the sale of GC Man. They've been tipped off that Dr. Bradstreet's supply of the substance may have been tainted. Were there ever moments when you became concerned that the work he was doing could be really problematic for him personally? I started to hear about the GCMAF. Yes. And that, you know, it's like, what do you mean it's not licensed in this country? And I thought, whoa, 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 what are we getting into here? The morning of June 18th, 2015, the day before his body is found in the river, FDA agents storm Dr. Bradstreet's office. It's the beginning of the end for Dr. Bradstreet. On June 19, 2015, Dr. Jeff Bradstreet is found dead in a river with a gunshot wound to the chest. Just one day after agents from the Federal Drug Administration raid his office. That day, they have a warrant to seize anything related to a drug he'd been prescribing called GC Math. They were looking for anything to do with GC Math. Historical documents, medical records, patient records, financial documents, anything associated with uh, GC Math. That's what they were looking for. Yes, sir. With Dr. Bradstreet now dead, what the FDA found remains a mystery to anyone outside the agency. So I have people hinting, openly suggesting that Big Pharma or the FDA had something to do with Dr. Bradstreet's death. I've got to tell you, our team has been working for months to try to lock down an interview with the FDA to find out what it uncovered in its raid on Dr. Bradstreet's office to try to get to the bottom of all of this. At the end of the day, what we got back from the FDA was a statement. Let me read this to you, at least a portion of it. The FDA's longstanding policy is not to discuss criminal investigations and Dr. Bradstreet's suicide does not change that position. So that's it. We don't get to ask our questions. We don't get to put before the FDA some of the theories that are being offered to us. That's it, just that statement. So in the absence of something more detailed from the FDA, I'm just left with more speculation. But there is one person I can speak to who might have insight into the FDA's raid. Jamie Kiever, the police detective who has been investigating Dr. Bradstreet's death. Lieutenant Kiever was tipped off to Dr. Bradstreet's fear of the feds by none other than his widow. Jennifer. 
One of the things that Jennifer Bradstreet told me was that the, the FDA had raided his doctor's office the day before looking for illegal drugs that he was uh, prescribing to his patients. Did she use the term illegal? I don't know necessarily illegal, but drugs that were not approved by the federal government. Did you speak to the FDA? I did. My question to them was, could he be facing a prison sentence? And is it that possibly a year to year and a half in, in prison? Uh, loss of his doctor's license and also a hefty civil penalty. The FDA shared that with you? Correct. We've also conducted search warrants on computers we found in Dr. Bradstreet's car that showed that the night before the death he was looking at countries that did not have an extradition treaty with the United States, that he was planning on either going to leave the country and stay gone and never be extradited back to the United States, or he was going to possibly commit suicide. And if you're connecting dots, what you were hearing from the FDA was consistent with what you had heard from Jennifer Bradstreet. Correct. And to the people who say to you, the FDA was responsible, Big Pharma was responsible, Dr. Bradstreet would never take his own life. I would tell him, show me some hardcore evidence that we could, could follow. Without any type of evidence to support that, it's, it's just their theory. He had a lot of stressors in his life that would, you know, possibly cause him to commit suicide. While police believe the FDA raid led to desperation and suicide, Dr. Bradstreet's brother Tom tells me this was not his first run-in with the authorities. Back in 2003, he came under serious fire for using another unapproved therapy. What do you remember about the 2003 raid on his office? Financially, it was devastating because of all the legal fees uh, that he had. I mean, he spent hundreds of thousands of dollars defending himself in the case. Right. Did he have to shut down for a while? Never shut down. But I mean, talked to him. It, it hurt him, but it didn't stop him. The Bradstreet family including his daughter, E.B., don't buy that this latest FDA raid would have driven a man fortified by Christian faith and a strong ego to take his own life. My dad was a fighter, and he lived by the principle that you never give up. And so, I mean, he fought it once before in 2003, and he beat it, so I don't see why over 10 years later he couldn't beat it again. But while the family dismisses the idea of suicide, even they are now starting to doubt the elaborate conspiracy theories circulating online. If not suicide, it was murder. Who else could be a suspect? Early on, we... we entertain the idea that it could have been this, you know, big thing, big form and all that. And then we started to really piece together what was going on and we started to go, this just isn't making sense with Jennifer. After months of speculation about big pharma and the FDA, the family sites are now set on Dr. Bradstreet's widow, Jennifer. I think the big flag that went up with this Jennifer relationship when she was upset at me for um, being involved in the investigation and not taking the face value, that it was a suicide. EB told me that 
she was really mad, very, very upset that um, we needed to stop the investigation. Did you have a conversation with Jennifer where she expressed her dissatisfaction with the idea of a continuing investigation? No, she'd stopped communicating with us totally. Tom would soon learn he was not the only one cut off from Jennifer, as her silence fuels a growing suspicion and stops an investigation. In September 2015, Dr. Jeff Bradstreet's final autopsy and death certificate are released. The official classification, suicide. But this case is still open, and questions are lingering about his widow, Jennifer. On June 19th, the day that Dr. Bradstreet's body is found in the river, Jennifer is at the scene before the police. One of the most suspicious things to me is the first person here is Mrs. Bradstreet. She's here because she's driving along this road and she spots her, her husband's vehicle. Hello, we're on fishing out here on uh, the creek and we found a dead body here. A fisherman has spotted the body, has called to another fisherman who's close by, and they both report seeing Mrs. Bradstreet. Pacing back and forth. Pacing back and forth. Tony, we made it down here. If I thought my loved one were here, I'd make my way down here to find them. And you know what's interesting? They don't report her up there screaming, Jeff, 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 where are you? Police, that we're going to do cops or what? Yeah, we're going to send officers out through there, OK? If I were desperate to find my loved one, I, I would make an effort to find them. I wouldn't just pace back and forth. What I see is Mrs. Bradstreet behaving extraordinarily suspiciously after his death. But Michael Archer wasn't there that day. Lieutenant Jamie Keever is the one who questioned Jennifer at the scene. How would you describe her demeanor, her state of mind? She was you know, visibly upset. She was crying some. Was there ever a moment when you seriously thought of Jennifer Bradstreet as a suspect? She didn't relay or give off anything that she had something to hide or uh, would be a suspect. But the day after Dr. Bradstreet dies, Lieutenant Kiva realizes he needs more information from Jennifer. My plan is to make contact with Jennifer Bradstreet again and, and ask those questions. But before he even reaches out, Lieutenant Kiever gets a call from a local criminal defense attorney, David Teddy. His statement was, uh, I'm going to advise her not to have any more contact with you. What are you thinking? I'm thinking this is a mess. Well, why is an attorney not letting a wife of a victim answer any more questions to him? Usually the only time that happens is in a, a homicide investigation. Fair to say this is a red flag? It is a red flag. And I told him that he was making um, Mrs. Bradstreet look like a suspect. You weren't able to persuade him. As of today, you know. As of today? Yep. Uh, last time I talked to him was probably a year ago. Has he reached back to you? No, sir. Our team has reached out to David Teddy for months, requesting an interview with Jennifer or with him, but he sees no reason to speak with us or the authorities. 
the death certificate should be the last word on this case. And it concludes suicide. What was the manner of death? Suicide. The final report says suicide. Correct. So, Lieutenant, why isn't this a closed case? I get asked that a lot, but I want to be 100% sure. Jennifer Bradstreet still has the information that I think can, can help solidify that it is a suicide. You believe Jeffrey Bradstreet killed himself? I do. Lieutenant Keever wants Jennifer to come in, not just to confirm his findings and close the case, but for the sake of a family who won't stop digging for answers. It was murder. That is what I ultimately believe, that it was murder. Law enforcement disagrees with you. I understand that. Law enforcement says we've looked at the evidence, and this is our conclusion. However, I believe they didn't fully investigate. You believe law enforcement dropped the ball in the investigation? I believe so. When it comes to the Bradstreet case, it's the family's judgment that weighs heaviest on Lieutenant Kiefer. I want to be able to, when, when I retire, so that I have done everything I can for this family. You're getting emotional. What's happening here? Um, I'm a professional, and for people to doubt my work is, I guess, upsetting. I'm hoping that maybe a polygraph examination of, of Jennifer will hopefully convince him that it, it was a suicide. While Lieutenant Kiefer is looking to Jennifer to confirm his theory that the doctor indeed killed himself, Tom Bradstreet wants her to talk for a different reason. I do think that Jennifer is uh, withholding information either because she has uh, an interest in it or is afraid that could shed more light on the truth. I do believe that she's involved in it. It's the only thing that makes sense on why she is withholding communicating with the police. Two separate investigations into one mysterious death. A grieving family searching for the truth and a lieutenant looking for closure on a case mired in conspiracy theories. Both waiting for a widow's final word that may never come. Thank you.